soul in the name of Jesus. We pray that as we leave today, we will not leave as we came in the name of Jesus. This word will not only inform, but transform our lives in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we are praying. Praise the Lord. Could you look at your neighbor and say, good morning, my neighbor? Thank you for coming to church. Praise the Lord. That, that song, I believe, is a word of prophecy to somebody. Trust me, God knows your name. He sees each tear that falls. He knows the thoughts of your heart. And trust me, he will not only prove to you that he knows your name, he will come true for you in Jesus' name. All right, good morning, church, once again. I'd like to start by saying a very big thank you to our pastors in the house, Pastor Jacob Obaro and Pastor Mrs. Ifoma Obaro. You know, these days you hear things like, can your pastor ever? You know what I'm talking about? So it's a very big privilege. I don't take it for granted. All right, this morning, quickly, we'll talk about something that I've captioned, multi-skilling as a tool for relevance. Multi-skilling, meaning skill, skilling from skill. So multi-skilling, it's one word, hyphenated. Multi-skilling as a tool for relevance. Okay, let me just quickly, I see that my slide, I have a slide, I see it's not up, so let me just, okay. So we're talking about multi-skilling as a tool for relevance. So the first question is, what is multi-skilling? However, before we go there, I'll read something from you, for you from the verse of scripture that we read. It's in Exodus 31, 2 to 5. Exodus 31, 2 to 5. The Bible says, See, I have called the name of Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Or, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship to design artistic works to work in gold, in silver, in bronze. This is just one man, and God was speaking to Moses about the kind of understanding and the kind of skill that he had given to this man. The work was to be done in the house of God, and God himself spoke to Moses. It wasn't Mo this man going to Moses to say, I can do this thing. It was God announcing the kind of skill that he had given to this man. And he said, look at it. I have filled him with the spirit of God, meaning that it is by the spirit of God that he has this kind of wisdom and skill that he has. He says, in understanding, in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship. He says, to design artistic works, to work in gold, in silver, in bronze, in cutting jewels for setting, in carving wood, and to work in all manner of workmanship. One man. So it's very important for us to understand the times and seasons. The Bible speaking about the sons of Issachar, it says there were men who had understanding of times and seasons to know what they ought to do for time. We're in such a season when people are crying, things are hard, things are difficult. What do we do in a time like this? One of the things that you need to understand that economists, people who have studied, you know, nations over time, have come to realize one thing. Recessions usually have about a seven-year cycle. The last time we had a major recession was around 2008. So seven years plus 2008 gives you what? 2015. Add seven years to 2015. What's the next one? 2022. So you realize that the impact of what happened, even though we say it's post-COVID, is what we are beginning to see right now. Go and check from history, economic crises have a seven-year cycle. After every seven years, there will be something major that happens that disrupts or that distracts the economy. So what do you do differently? Let's see something that Daniel did. Daniel prayed. But when Daniel prayed, let's see how God answered him. The Bible says in the book of Daniel 9, 21 to 22. Daniel chapter 9, verse 21 to 22. The Bible says, yes, while I was speaking in prayer, 
If you read from verse 1 all the way to 20, Daniel was praying, praising God, asking God for mercy. What have we done? I, Daniel, understood by the books. We're supposed to be in captivity for seven years. What's going on? Then verse 21, see what now happened. Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering, and he informed me and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I have come now forth to give you skill to understand. I've come to do what? To give you skill to understand. Daniel was praying for mercy. Daniel was praying that the nation of Israel should be delivered. Daniel was praying, why are we dealing with all of these things? What's going on? But the angel came. What did he say? He says, I have come to give you skill to understand. He didn't say, I've come to deliver you. He didn't say, I've come to get you out of the problem. He didn't say to Daniel, now this is what is going to happen. I will do this, I will do this, I will do that. And all the problems will go away. But the angel came and said, I have come to give you skill to understand. So it means that some of you, the answer to your prayer can be a skill. And until you take hold of that skill that is the answer to your prayer, you will continue praying. Now imagine if after God had told Daniel, I have come to give you skill to understand and Daniel continued to pray. What do you think would have happened to Daniel? The angel would just continue laughing, isn't it? Because he says what you need is the skill to understand. You don't need to pray about all these other things. They are set. They are cast in stone. But if you understand the seasons, if you understand the times, you can flow with them. So many of you, you need to understand what is happening in these times and how to adjust yourself to it. Just like the sons of Issachar knew what to do. This is no longer the season where you say, I'm not a business person. I'm just a career person. Ah, once I have a job that pays me salary, that is enough for me. Me, it's soft life I came to live. Should we tell them? <laughs> the soft life can be made hard overnight. Because somebody who owns that business where you work, and they can wake up and change things. And there's nothing you can do about it. Even when you pray, sometimes for some of you, you know, sometimes I, I hope some of you know that the answer to some of the prayers that you pray here is that God is going to push you out of that comfort zone. Help me tell your neighbor, God might push you. Will you like it when he pushes you? Remember the story of our father and the Lord, a man said, oh, I want to sponsor the entire convention. And the man was saying it to Daddy Gio, and he was proud about it. I said, well, God will make it happen for you. A few days later, he came by and said, ah, they sacked me. He said, when you say you want to sponsor the convention, you thought it was your salary that would make it happen. But then God opened some other doors. So, quickly, what is multi-skilling? What is multi-skilling? There are four things that can, re, that can be referred to as multi-skilling, and I'll quickly take you through them. The first is to have multiple skills. To have multiple skills. That's the first thing it means, to have multiple skills. The second thing that multi-skilling means is, don't mind this word, you know, some of you may have to consult dictionary after service. <laughs> to be a multi-potentialite. Multipotentialite. Let me make it easier for you. When you hear multipotentialite, it simply means multipotential, then add L I T E. Multipotentialite. So when you hear multi skilling, the first of multi skilling is to have multiple skills. The second is to be a multipotentialite. Some of you are multipotentialites. You know what that means? You have many interests with creative pursuits. So that's why some of you seem confused. How many adults here still still very confused about what they really want to do? I mean, today you feel like it's photography. Tomorrow you feel like it's editing. Tomorrow you feel like, ah, I'm a singer. And then the next day you feel like I'm a preacher, I'm a teacher. And then the next day you're feeling like, ah, is this artificial intelligence thing that is really my thing? And all of a sudden you're wondering what's going on with me? Don't worry, you're not alone. Can I make a true confession? I'm a multi-potentialite. Meaning that I have many multiple skills. And guess what? When I switch, I can switch effortlessly and still operate effectively in any of them. So, it's not a bad thing. Even though if you're not careful with it, it can distract you. Then the next thing is 
to deploy a single skill, listen to me carefully, to deploy a single skill skillfully in different scenarios. That's what multi-skilling also means. To deploy a single skill skillfully in different scenarios. I'll give you an example. I'm a speaker. In church, they will call me what? When I get into the corporate world, I'm called a training facilitator. When I'm pitching an idea to somebody else or when I'm on television, they will say it's what? A presentation. The only skill I'm using there is the ability to speak. But in church, this same person is a preacher. In the corporate world, when it's training, this person is a training facilitator. In the, on TV, this person is a speaker. And in different places, but it's simply the ability to do what? To speak. You are a writer, it will be different things. In church, you are this, and for social media, you are a content creator. You say you are doing business development, or you say you are doing business proposal, but it's simply the ability to write. So sometimes, multi-skilling is that you have one ability, but you know how to deploy it differently. Let me quickly make it a bit spiritual. You see, some people have, they know that the anointing on their head is not much. They know. The anointing is not much. But you see, the way they will use and maximize that anointing, they make so much noise, much more than people who know that are heavily anointed. Have you seen people like that before? So, there are some people, they know that this is the only skill that I have. And with that skill that they have, they will use it so well that everybody will shout, this guy is so talented, this guy is so talented. But there are others who have multiple skills. You will never hear about them. Then the fourth one, which is the final definition, is to consciously acquire multiple relevant skills for a purpose. That's what multi-skilling is. To consciously acquire multiple relevant skills for a purpose. We'll talk about what it means to consciously acquire multiple relevant skills in a bit. Now, is this even relevant to those of us who are Christians? Should we even be talking about multi-skilling? On a Sunday morning, should we be talking about being a multi-potentialite? Why is this even very important? Or why are we talking about it? So let's now look at people who are Bible characters who had multiple skills. Because there are quite a number of them. The first of them is Joseph. We see the story, we see the case of Joseph in Genesis 41, 39 to 41. Genesis 41, 39 to 41. Then the next one you would also see is Genesis 41, 25 to 32. I'm just going to be listing the verses of scripture because there are quite a number of them. We won't have time to read them. Genesis 41, 39 to 41. That's the first one. Then the second one, Genesis 41, the same chapter, 25 to 32. Joseph had... One moment, please. Okay, I guess that's it. So, Joseph had multiple skills. Joseph had the skill of administration. He had the skill of dream interpretation and leadership. Administration, dream interpretation, and leadership, and you see that in everything, I, I, I think I've thought before too as well, you realize that before Joseph got to where he was going, what he needed was interpretation of dreams. But by the time he got into the palace, he no longer needed the skill for interpretation of dreams. What he now needed was what? Administrative skills. That's what sustained him in the palace. So you need to understand that Joseph was, mod, was a multipotentialite, like, uh, like as, we, as we just said. He had multiple skills. The second person is David. David was a shepherd, a warrior, a musician, and a king. You might also add a dancer. Because one of, the most, uh, one of the most famous things about David was the way he danced. Danced in an undignified manner. You see, in 1 Samuel 16, 18, he was described as a skillful musician, a warrior, and a wise man. In 1 Samuel 17, 34 to 37, 1 Samuel 17, 34 to 37, David explains his experience as a shepherd and a fighter. He was saying that when the lion came against the sheep, I defended them. So David was a multi-skilled person. The next one is Daniel. 
We just read, uh, I just talked about Daniel and how he was praying and God responded to him with a skill. Daniel had wisdom, dream interpretation, administration, and even prophecy. You see, in Daniel 1.17, Daniel and his companions are given knowledge and wisdom. In Daniel 2, 19 to 23, Daniel interprets Nebuchadnezzar's dream. It was the skill of interpretation of dream and administration that caused Daniel to be relevant to four different administrations. At least four different kings. If he wasn't that skillful, maybe like Joseph, he would only be relevant with the reign of just one king. But Daniel, even after the death of two, three other kings, Daniel was still relevant. The fourth person is Nehemiah. Nehemiah had the skill of governance, leadership, and project management. You know that, of course, he was a butler. Nehemiah, in two, uh, Nehemiah 2, 17 to 18, he was leading the team to rebuild the wall. And one of the things I like about him is that he even understood strategy. He knew that there were people who wanted to distract him. So rather than allowing them to distract him, he taught them, we're going to have our swords on one hand and we're going to fight and build the wall on the other hand. So on one hand, they were building. On the other hand, they were ready to fight. That's a strategy. So if these people think that we're going to focus on fighting alone, it's a lie. If they think that we're going to focus on building alone so that they can attack us suddenly, it's a lie. So we're going to build, but we're ready to fight. We're going to fight, but we're still going to be building. That's strategy. Then in Nehemiah 1.11, you see that he was the king's butler. The fifth one, the fifth person is Moses. Moses is a leader, a lawgiver, a mediator, or a negotiator. Because you realize that he went to Pharaoh at least ten times. To go and negotiate. Negotiating the release of the nation of Israel. In the, today's what we call it mediation. Dispute resolution. International diplomacy. I mean, if we were going to give Moses an honorary doctorate degree, he would have been honorary doctorate degree in peace and conflict resolution or uh, mediation. Because he went back to Pharaoh over and over and over again. He took a skill to be able to do that. And he was a military leader because he was leading them to fight. In Exodus 18, 13 to 16, Moses judges the people. And don't forget that Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, who was a priest, was also a leadership strategist. How was he a leadership strategist? He was the one that introduced systems delegation to Moses. How did he introduce systems delegation? Moses sat and was judging everybody that came. From morning to night, he said to him, this is no wisdom. This is lack of wisdom. This thing that you are doing, it will wear you out. Why don't you appoint Told him what to do. Appoint people. Make them leaders over groups. And these people will be the ones to judge over them. And the spirit, God took upon the spirit of Moses and put upon all the other leaders. That's where system delegations began from. Next person is Paul. You see that Paul is a tent maker, a preacher, a lawyer, and a writer. We know today we preach a lot because Paul wrote more than two-thirds of the New Testament. But he was a tent, and he bragged. He said, look, I'm not a burden to you. You know that I am a tent maker. I'm a preacher. I'm a lawyer and a writer. And you see that in Acts 18.3, Paul works as a tent maker. In Romans 15, 15 to 16, Romans 15, 15 to 16, Paul's role as a preacher and minister to the Gentiles was also seen there. So he's preaching. We know that he was a lawyer, and we also know that he's a tent maker. And that helped him not to be a burden on anybody. The next person is Solomon. Solomon had wisdom. Of course, you know that he asked God for wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And because he asked God for knowledge, wisdom, and understanding, the next thing is that God gave him money. And in addition, we saw the manifestation of that wisdom with the architecture that he had and administration. So much so that Queen of Sheba traveled all the way from Africa to visit Solomon. You see, what did, what did she say when she got there? He said, in fact, what they told me, I thought it was exaggerated. But now that I got here, they didn't even tell me half of what is on ground. When they were telling me about you, I thought it was exaggerated. But now that I'm here, <laughs> what I'm seeing here, they didn't even tell me half of what's on ground. That's the kind of skill that Solomon had. 1 Kings 3, 12, Solomon is endowed with wisdom and understanding. 1 Kings 6, 
two to ten, Solomon oversees the building of the temple. And of course, we saw the manifestation of wisdom in how he also decided who was the real owner of a child in a, in a season when people were eating their children. And the final one is from our anchor text, Bezalel. We already read about Bezalel earlier, Exodus 31, uh, 2 to 5. He was a craftsman, skilled in construction. He could make gold. He could make silver. He could make bronze. He could make different things, artistic designs. Only one man. Different things that he could do. And God was the one announcing him to Moses. So having established that we have people in scripture that are multi-skilled, I hope that with these few points of mind, I've been able to convince and not to confuse you that it is scriptural to be multi-skilled, right? Are we okay with that? All right, so the seven purposes of multi-skilling. What are the seven purposes of multi-skilling? Number one, the times are changing and new skills are needed. The times are changing and new skills are needed. Sometimes you may have heard that what brought you this far is not what will take you to the next phase. So the skill that got you the job may not be the skill that will keep you on the job. Many of you, you know, if you're not careful, you got the job because at the time the company was growing, they needed everybody. But now the company is growing bigger or has grown bigger. They no longer need just everybody. They need people with specialized skills. I remember years ago when my mom got a job with what they used to call NEPA, you know. It, it was a time when typewriter was a thing. And then she got the job and she was effective. And after a while, typewriter was no longer a thing. And computers were brought into the country. And when computers were brought into the country, you know what my mom did? She would, after work, after work, she enrolled in a computer school. Imagine my mom after work with children. All her children were grown-ups. But she still enrolled in a computer school. So she finished work, go to a computer school, learn to use a computer so that she could keep her job. So what got you on the job may not be what will keep you on the job. The times are changing and new skills are needed. Number two, yesterday's great skills may become obsolete today. Yesterday's great skills may become obsolete today. Can I ask you, in this generation, how many of you know what a fax machine is? Or you've seen a fax machine before? How many? Can you imagine? Nobody even knows what it is. Okay, the, the, I can see the elders in the house. <laughs> but you see, the younger generation, nobody knows what a fax machine is. Why? Because WhatsApp is what is our fax machine today. Who needs a... F I mean, the fax machine is so tiny, very little message that you can pass on it, and then you have to wait. What, in the days of instant messaging, what, what, what am I faxing? Then number three, multiple skills lead to multiple opportunities. Multiple skills lead to multiple opportunities. You realize that even in the Garden of Eden, and that's in the book of Genesis, God made it clear to us that there were four rivers that came into the garden. And sometimes we've talked repeatedly over it to say that it represents four streams of income. I remember one of them is Havila. So if there are four streams leading into that garden, it tells you that there is no reason why you should have just only one stream of income or just one skill that you can depend on. So multiple skills lead to multiple opportunities. Then, number four, with multiple opportunities, you can always earn more. With multiple opportunities, you can earn more. Let me also tell you why people underprice you. One of the reasons people underprice you, if you're a service person, you're also an employee, you're an entrepreneur, one of the reasons they underprice you is because that's the only skill you have. That's your only source of income. Take, for example, if you have another source of income from somewhere and somebody is underpricing you, what will you say? Years ago, I used to say this, even though I, I'll be careful how I say it. You know, one of the reasons I could leave any job conveniently, one of the reasons I could leave any job, if I notice that the environment is toxic, is because I know I had other sources. Just five years ago, I was working somewhere and I was writing for one of the popular blogs in Nigeria. I don't want to mention him. But I was writing for one of the popular blogs in Nigeria. And what the blog was paying me on a monthly basis was more than two times my salary where I was working. The day one of my colleagues found out, she, she just said to me, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? This money is not enough for all of us. You are still here with us collecting. What are you doing here? Because what the blog was paying me monthly was more than two times my salary. So, Multi, with multiple opportunities, you can earn more. Number five, multiple opportunities makes you more relevant in your industry. Multiple opportunities make you more relevant in your industry. You know, it, it, it's one thing to be the one begging for a job. It's another thing to be people begging you to come and work with them. 
People can beg you to come and walk with them. See how God was announcing somebody to Moses. Please, what other referral do you need when it is God doing the referral for Bezalel to Moses? Which other referral is bigger than that? Number six, with multiple skills, there's no retirement age. You know, one of the things that happens to people is that once they start approaching a particular age, they are worried, ah, those loans I used to get from cooperative, I can't get them again. What will happen? Ah, they will not be paying me this very little. Ah, what's going to happen? But with multiple skills, take for example, take for example, look at me as a speaker. At what age do you think I'm going to retire? Any guess? <laughs> or as a writer, at what age am I going to retire? Maxwell is, I think, John Maxwell is, I think, 77 or so. But I don't know his exact, but he's in his 70s. He just released another book. When you have multiple skills, there's no retirement age. No retirement age. Then, multiple skills. No retirement age. Then, multiple skills make you globally relevant, which is the most important point of all these seven. It makes you globally relevant. There are skills you have today, yet they are only relevant because you are here in Nigeria. The moment you leave the shores of this country, it doesn't make any sense to anybody outside of this country. So, if you are saying, God, take me global, God, take me global, God, take, what skill do you have that they need on the global scale? If God were to grant you visas today to the U.S., to the U.K., to Canada, to any other country, what skill do you have that will make you relevant in those other countries? So, you need to have globally relevant skills. And that's why that tells you that you don't just go and acquire all the skills. We're not talking about becoming a bobo niche here. You know what I mean? No, 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 we're not talking. It's something that you are deliberate and intentional about. Deliberate and intentional about it. So, categories of multi-skilling. The categories of multi-skilling. The first is the professional. Do you know that today, in several organizations, accountants are becoming HR professionals too? I hope you know that. In some other organizations, the HR professional is also a lawyer, or the lawyer is an HR professional. You get to some other organizations, you realize that the learning and development professional is also the HR person. Why do you think they are doing all of that? It's to tell you that, look, for, your, for example, in my own case in the corporate world, I can switch effortlessly into learning and development. I can switch into HR. I can switch into communications. So it's not a matter of I don't have a choice. It's a matter of which slot do you have that is available. So if it's communications, I fit in. If it's HR, I fit in. If it's L&D, I fit in. So even as a professional, find a way to do something else that you are not stranded in that career. Find a way to do something else that you can switch effortlessly. If opportunities, you know, so whether you like it or not, there are some organizations where there's no room for growth. I hope you know. And it's not because they are intentional. It's just that the organization has not grown to the level where there is a growth track for anybody working there. It's just their level. There's no path for growth. And once you reach the peak, that's why they employ you. You say, five years I've been here, no promotion. There's no way to promote you to. That's the peak of the career. But when you can switch into an organ other organization effortlessly, then it becomes easier for you to grow. You know that in, there were days when people used to earn double degrees. I don't know why they don't do it anymore in Nigeria. Ab abroad, there are other countries that still do it that you can have combined honors. So you don't only graduate as an accountant, you don't only graduate as a lawyer, you can be a lawyer but you have another degree, you can be an accountant, you have another degree, you can be a trainer, you have another degree somewhere else. So make sure that even as a professional, you have different degrees. So people used to earn double honors. Find a way to increase your skill across professionals. That's why lawyers are becoming real estate guys now. Somebody is looking at me, but I won't look in that direction. <laughs> so be multi-skilled even as a professional. Then number two, the entrepreneurial. That's the entrepreneurial category. You can be multi-skilled even as an entrepreneur. There's nothing wrong in doing multiple businesses. You see, some of the guys that I like the most that are really smart, today, you start selling, for example, Ewagoin. And as you start selling your Ewagoin, you notice that people are asking for bread. Instead of going down the street to go and buy a, a bread, the next day, what has happened? The person has added bread to it. He said, don't walk too far. We are here to serve you. Why? Because the person knows that if somebody, in, in marketing and in product development, there's what, they call, there's what they call product line. A product line would be 
multiple products that are on the same level and, you know, they, 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 they are complementary products. You, for example, you buy bread, you can need butter, right? You buy bread, you will need egg. You buy egg, you, will, you know, something like that. If you buy, if you have egg, you will need vegetable oil to fry it, right? So a smart person who is going into business and is trying to start a supermarket, or is that, what you need to do is to look at product lines. Meaning that if this person buys this, then they must buy this. For example, somebody buys a shirt. They must wear trousers on the shirt now. And somebody wears trousers on the shirt, they will need socks on it, right? And somebody needs socks, they will need shoes, right? So it's common sense. Don't sell socks alone. Don't sell shirts alone. You get the point? Make it a product line. That's what we do. And I see that quite a... Sorry? Oh, okay. Sorry. Sorry, uh, technology is messing us up a bit, so I have to keep resharing my... So, it, it, yeah, it's back up. So, it's important for you to note that the entre- even as an entrepreneur, you can have multiple skills. For example, I know a brother. The brother does not... I, I, don't let me cast the secret of some people. Do you know that there are people who do not sew? But they come to you, I can sew, I can sew. They take your measurements, they do everything. They know where to take it to. They take it to the person, they collect money from you, they bring it back to you, you wear the clothes, it looks like you were cloned into it. But the person does not know how to sew. The only thing they know how to do is what? Take measurements. Start from there. That's how to learn sewing first. Start from there. Start from there. Do you know that there are some other times when there are some things that people do, you don't even know how to do them. You just need to know how to market. For example, they've been telling you your amount is sweet, your amount is sweet. You see somebody who sells product, nice product, classy product, with your sweet mouth, what are you doing with it? Go to the person and say, this product, you sell it for 20000 right? Let me, apologies, let me give an example. I see that one of our sisters in choir, TLA, I see the products that she has, I see shoes, I see all of that. Go, you have sweet mouth, go to TLA and say, you, you'd sell these shoes for maybe 20K, maybe 30K. Don't worry, that's your own price. Me, I will sell it for 35K. Don't, don't ask me who I sold it to. Just give me 10 pieces. And then I'll go and market, sell for to them that I can even put my brand on it. I hope that most of the things, I hope you know, most of the things you are buying, it's not the person you are buying from that manufactured them. Some of them will have somebody else manufacturing in the secret. They put their label on it. All they are doing is marketing. That's all they are doing. So sometimes the skill you just need is, you already have the mouth. Convert that sweet mouth to marketing. A brother too up there, Ratosin, does a lot of shirts. You don't know, need to know how to sew. Just say, don't worry, you guys need shirts? Ah, in my company, you guys need shirts? 100 pieces, don't worry, say no more. I'll give it to you. Come to Brotosin. Brotosin, we need 100 shirts. Tell me how much you will collect. Go to your company or go to, give them invoice. Brotosin is collecting, say, for example, example, 10K. Give them 20K. Uh, sorry, 20 is too much. 12K. <laughs> 20 is too much, oh. On a percent, let me, let me give you a rule. A pricing strategy. A pricing strategy. Maximum between 10 to 15 percent, or, or sorry, maximum 10 to 20 percent markup on the cost. So, whatever it costs, maximum that is fair, maximum between 10 to 20 percent. If it's more than 20 percent, it, it can be a good deal for you if it's more than 20 percent and a service, but if it's a product, ideally, it shouldn't be more than 20 percent gain. So, if something costs, say, 20,000, what's 20 percent of 20,000? 4,000. So if you sell it for 24, 25,000, it still makes sense. Do you understand what I'm saying? So go to the person that buys, that creates it, collects it. You do your invoice and say, oh yeah, as business not started. All right. My time is running. Wow. The last one is the vocational because I want to be sure that I'm not leaving out the vocational people. The first category is what? Professional. The second category? And the last one is vocational so the vocational guys too you need to sorry i need to i want to reshare my the vocational guys you need to understand that there there are things you can do too that definitely you can uh you can multi-skill as well so you're a tailor for example don't stay with just sewing don't stay with that alone even if that is your skill for now there are other things that you can add to the sewing. Take for example, uh, if there's a strategy, you learned by, you learned sewing, they show you this is how they do it, you, this is how they do it. Have you learned pattern drafting as well? 
So when you get to that level, you are no longer a tailor, you are becoming a fashion designer. And then the, what you are able to charge changes. So everything is about strategy. Let me go back to uh, my slide there, the vocational part. So I know a guy who used to paint. This same guy, the first house I lived in after I got married, this guy came to our house. He was the one painting. He was the one doing the tiles. He was the one doing the bricklaying. I said, ah, ah, I've forgotten his name now. I said, hey, in the canton. But the man, he, and guess what? He got all the money because he could do everything. For example, I do photography, live streaming. Video, I, I started video editing. You know why I started video editing? I used to do some short, short videos. When video editors told me how much they were going to be collecting per video, I learned video editing by force. And it's been saving me over 500000 in costs. Because when I calculated what they were going to charge, it doesn't make sense. Not that it doesn't make sense, but like, ah, I had to go and learn it. If you see, I don't know how many of you saw me during the light off. His camera I was carrying all about. One camera on this side, one camera on this side. Don't try me old. <laughs> It's just to tell you that, look, these things we're talking about is something that we practice as well. We are multi-skilled. So, the next one, okay, where to learn multiple skills? You can go on YouTube. You can go on TikTok. There, there are some people you follow on TikTok, they just make you laugh and laugh and laugh. At the end of the day, when your data is out, your sorrow returns. Don't follow those people. Choose the people that teach you something. On YouTube, subscribe to channels that teach you something. On Coursera, Coursera.org is strictly for teaching. Coursera.org, Udemy.com, Alice, and don't do short, short courses and abandon them. Take one, finish it. Take another one, finish it. Years ago when I was doing, you know, all the things that our media guys are, fantastic what they are doing here, the things that they are doing, the first reading Paris that I fully attended, you know, I will take my phone, I will record videos, do these, take short videos, take pictures and everything, created the social media accounts for them, posted it online. I was doing it as a passion for the church. All of a sudden, they needed to do a major conference. They needed somebody to promote it. That's how my provincial pastor came to me. He said, can you promote this thing for us online? I said, yes. They said, are you sure? I said, yes. They, they then took me to our regional pastor. I said, come with a proposal. I was supposed to talk for 10 minutes. I spoke for two minutes. Our regional pastor said, say no more. You got the job. Should I tell you the figure? You like me, Boru. But it, was in, but it was in a couple of millions. It was in a couple of millions just for a period of four weeks. <laughs> I spent the money, they do. <laughs> so the caveat, <laughs> even though we're asking you to multi-skill, we're not saying that you should just double into everything. So how do you now balance the fact that, yes, you have to multi-skill in order to remain relevant, you can earn more money, even when you have worked Monday to Friday, over the weekend you can still do something, or even while you are in the office, something you have created, you can still, what do you, where do you strike the balance? Number one, make sure that you are acquiring skills that are interconnected. Acquire skills that are what? Interconnected, so that you are not distracted. If the skills are completely unrelated, it may not help you. For example, when I was giving you instances under the professional category, I mentioned how accountants are becoming HR. Why is it that accountants are becoming HR? At the end of the day, if they had accounting separate, HR separate, who is going to pay the money to the staff? Accountant. So they feel, okay, instead of accounting separate, HR separate, why don't we just have somebody manage both of them? So make sure that you work on that. Then remember this, Psalm 1 verse 3, the Bible says, it shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruits in season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever it does, does what? Emphasis, whatever it does. Meaning that there is no limit to what you can do. Whatever it does, prospers. And the final scripture, because my time is up now, Ecclesiastes 9.10, the Bible says, whatever your hand finds to do, what do you do? Do it with your might, for there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. Please rise to your feet. Let's just pray for one thing. Say, Father, grant me wisdom. Grant me wisdom. Grant me wisdom. Father, grant me wisdom in the way to go. Grant me wisdom. I now know I need multiple skills. Father, grant me wisdom. Father, grant me wisdom. Father, grant me wisdom. Father, grant me wisdom.